Well, today we begin a new series, and, and we're really beginning a new season in the fall. And um, we're back to two services, so feel free next week. I, I don't mind. You can move forward. Like, I don't mind if you move forward to some of these empty seats in the front. I know maybe you're wondering, like, does Joel want us to be close, or um, we like to be back. But don't worry. You can come closer if you want next week. I won't be offended. Uh, to those in the first two rows, extra blessing on you. May the Lord anoint you and bless you. Uh, first three rows. Let's give it the first three rows. You really are. You really, oh, there we go. Through a third row. Third row is waiting for that wave. Um, yeah, we pray also for the last row. May the Lord bless you and keep you and watch over your soul. Um, I'm just kidding. You can sit wherever you want, but... Our series is called I Am, Discovering God Through His Own Words. I, I want to just pull up, I don't know if we have that graphic, if we don't, um, but the original graphic for the whole series, we don't, if we do, okay, we don't. But I, I didn't realize this, but when we had thought about the series title, we, we titled it I Am, and then we had a colon and then it was discovering God through his own words, I believe is the wording. Um, thank you. Boom, Jonathan. So at first it was, it was I am was a sermon title and then a colon and then discovering God through his own words. But then I realized God is sneaky because there's, there's a revelation in this as we read it as a sentence. I am discovering God through his own words. And I felt the Lord saying this to me that as we begin this series, that we would pause even now before I begin. And I want you to lean in personally. This isn't a declaration of the church, but over us personally, that we would say, Father, I am discovering you through your own words. And so before we even begin, I want to pray this over us, Father, that we would discover you through your own words, that personally, intimately, we would each say, I am discovering God through his own words. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Title this morning is, I am who I am. Many times in our life, we settle for secondhand knowledge about who someone is. We often ask for job references before we hire someone to see what kind of worker were they. If we meet someone that we're interested in dating, many times we'll ask somebody that knows them, hey, what about this person? Are they, are they good for me? Are they safe? Are they funny? Are they good looking? Are they whatever? In school, teachers will offer comments about how our kids are behaving in class. Many times we receive secondhand knowledge and we make assumptions and presumptions and conclusions based on that secondhand knowledge. There are many times that we don't really know who someone is or what they're like and so we ask someone that knows them but we never really know someone unless we talk to them directly. Unless we have a conversation with them. Unless we begin a friendship or a relationship with them. We live in a world where we settle for secondhand knowledge about what someone is like, who they are, how they're wired. This knowledge that we gain about other people is called a reputation. People will develop good or bad reputations and we'll often know what someone's like before we even meet them. And sometimes what we hear and what we know and what we have experienced isn't who the person is at all. Have you ever misunderstood someone? Have you ever heard that someone was like something and then you've met them and it's been totally different? If I was to tell you about my wife, Sonia, I could tell you some things about her. 
I could tell you that she grew up in Port Moody. I could tell you that she went to Glen Eagle High School and graduated from there, that she went on to Trinity Western University, that she loves English literature. I could tell you that she loves gardening and farm animals and loves to get her hands dirty. I could tell you that she loves to take long walks on the beach with her favorite guy, our Bernie's mountain dog, Toby. I could tell you a lot about Sonia, but the only way to really get to know her is to talk to her yourself. With God, it's the same thing. We gather in community week after week. Many times we come into a church service and we listen to the pastor that day explaining who God is. The pastor will open up their Bible and she or he will read passages and, and we will attempt to describe to you what God is like, who he is through the word of God, through good biblical interpretation, through context and history and our own stories. And we will present it to you as kind of a meal that you would consume. While of course I believe in the value of gathering to hear the word of God preached, this isn't the sum total of our Christian life. This is secondhand learning. It's very important, but it's not the entire Christian experience. What I felt from the Lord is that he wants us each personally to be discovering him through who he says he is to you personally. We're all trying to get more knowledge about God. But deep inside, there is a gaping hole where relationship is supposed to be personally. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Don't take my word for it. Discover him yourself. This is the heartbeat of our new series. I'm saying to the Lord in this season, Jesus, I am discovering you in fresh new ways. I'm not satisfied with what I have learned about you. I'm not satisfied with what I have read. Even about things that I think I know a lot about. I want a fresh experience and encounter with a living God. Just like I want a fresh and new experience with Sonia. My wife, because we're in relationship. See, many times we come into church as if it's a classroom. It's not a classroom. I know. <laughs> Perfect timing. Someone's excited to go back to school, but you know what? It's more than that. I'm not saying it isn't that. It is. We gain knowledge. We learn new things. Awesome. Praise God. That's amazing. But we're entering into a place that enhances our relationship with Jesus. Christianity is more than a religion. It's a relationship. Our main point this morning is encountering God through his own words is an invitation to a deeper relationship with him. Our first question point this morning is, what is God like? Turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter three, verse seven and eight. Moses encounters God in a burning bush. And the Lord says to him, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. 
So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Something that R.C. Sproul, a reformed theologian, so I believe most of what he says, he points out this, we serve a God who sees our misery. We serve a God who hears our cries. We serve a God who is concerned. Think about that for a moment. Immediately, God introduces himself to Moses as a living God. God is introducing himself to the people who are in Egypt as a living God. He's saying, I see, I hear, and I'm concerned. This separates God from other gods. This means that God is not simply an object that we would bow down to. God is not just a gold cross around our neck. God is not just a book. God is not just a pulpit. God is not just a chair. Whatever objects of worship that we might think of when we think of God and when we think of church and when we think of worship, God is not contained in an object. I remember one time I was sharing at a, a, with a middle school class down at another church and I was explaining to them what the church sanctuary was. And it was a, a, a secular school, but I had the privilege of explaining what we do in a sanctuary wasn't this church building. It was an old building that we had um, on the Kingsway Avenue in Port Coquitlam. And so we're sitting here in a sanctuary much like this, but smaller. And in that church, the drum cage was sitting in the middle of the platform. And so I'm explaining to them about this is what we do each Sunday. We come and we sing songs and we we hear a message from the Bible and I'm explaining it. And then I took questions at the end. So one young boy raises his hand and he says, the drum cage. I said, yeah. He's like, the one behind you. So I turned around. It was in the center of the platform. He said, do you guys worship the drums? (laughs) I said, no, we don't worship the drums. I know they appear that way because they're in the center of the stage, but no, we don't worship the drums. We use the drums as a musical instrument of worship to the Lord. But I I realized, yeah, sometimes we can do some funny things. But God is saying, I'm not an object. I'm not an idol. I'm not mute. I see. I hear. I'm concerned. God is revealing himself as a person. God has a face, a name, a personality. He has character. He has nature. You see, a faceless God cannot love. A loveless God cannot draw a person to himself or woo a person into relationship. A mute God cannot speak. A dead God cannot save A compassionless God would never heal. We do not serve this kind of God. We do not worship this kind of God. We worship a God who sees and hears and is concerned. Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9, this is not in your notes, says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. If worshiping Jesus has not led you to feel more loved, 
to hear his voice, to sense his presence, to know salvation personally, you need a fresh encounter with the living God. God desires personal relationship with each and every one of you. God is not an impersonal force, an energy, a feeling. He is not simply knowledge to be gained. He is a person and I pursue him in relationship. Alpha is starting in a couple weeks and Alpha describes who Jesus is. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know him as a personal God. I, I, I accepted him into my life. I put my faith in him. I, I pursued him as knowledge. I've sought to understand what he's like, but I don't know him personally. If that's you, sign up for Alpha, who describes who is Jesus, who God is, what he is like, how he is personal. But we see the response of Moses as God encounters him. Moses has this encounter. Moses asks the question, who am I? <laughs> Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? As God encounters us for the first time and we encounter a personal God and we hear his voice and we experience his face and we sense his presence and we see his heart, the, the question we first ask in light of his presence is, who am I? And Moses asks this question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses is strangely aware of his weakness, specifically his speech, his lack of boldness. We believe that Moses had a stutter, so in weakness he's looking at himself. Who am I? I'm not a leader. I can't speak. Who am I to go? And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Horeb. God said to, I mean, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses is having an identity crisis. He's looking at his own weakness. He's saying, who am I to go? The two most important questions we all ask ourselves is who am I and why am I here? Who am I and why am I here? And Moses is caught up with both of these questions. Who am I and what am I even doing here? I'm not the one to go. Now, the thing I love about God is God doesn't answer Moses' question. Because God sees that underneath Moses' question of who am I is a deep insecurity. Moses thinks he's going alone and feels insecure. But God reassures Moses with the real answer to the question he's asking. And God says to him, instead of answering him, who am I? He answers him this, I will be with you and you are not alone. God doesn't always answer the question we ask. Have you ever asked God a specific question and he hasn't answered you in that way, but he's given you a different answer that's much deeper than the one that you thought you were seeking and it was so much better? You're like, no, I'm just confused. We ask God, who should we marry? God, who should I marry? Who, who's the, who, what kind of person should I marry? We ask God the question, who should I marry? And God tells us who to become. 
We might ask God, why am I sick? He might answer with, I'm the God who suffered as well. We ask God, how should I lead this church? And God told me, love them, listen to them, and serve them. I might ask God, God, what's the vision for this church? What's the direction? God, give me something practical, preferably with like, five objectives and goals that can clearly be followed. And God says, Joel becomes strangely aware of my presence. God doesn't always answer us in the way we want to be answered, but his answer is always exactly what we need. Moses says, who am I that I should go? And God says, I will be with you. So then Moses changes the question rather than who am I? He's forgotten about that. He says, okay, Lord, I get that. So you're going with me. Who are you now? Isn't this the relationship with God? Don't we see God interact with us? We want answers, clear, crystal clear, black and white answers. Okay, God, I get it. You're the one. Forget about me for a second. Then, then who should I tell them has sent me? And God says, I am. I am who I am. I don't know about you, but I, I would have sought a few more clarifying answers to that. I would have been like, God, can you just describe what I am means? I am is the name Yahweh, Yahweh. I am is so powerful because it's present. It's not I was, I will be, it's I am. God is present with Moses. I love this interaction. There's so many questions I have. But God also says to Moses, and you will know that I have sent you, Moses, not when you get there, not when you're unleashing the plagues upon the Egyptians, not in another burning bush along the way. He says, you'll know that I've sent you when you've returned here with the people. Hey, Moses, guess what? You're going to know that I am with you when you're finished. What did Moses have to rely on? I am. I am with you. I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Our third point and final point this morning is I am made alive in Christ. Now it's not explicit, it would be considered implicit, but Jesus is introduced to us in the burning bush. It's a manifestation of God, Jesus not in bodily form, Jesus not in human form, obviously, but, but a living God who speaks and Anytime God speaks as the word, Jesus is present. Not only is Jesus present in the command to Moses and in the burning bush, but Jesus is, is revealed in the story of how Moses would be used as a savior to bring people out of slavery. This would be a very Jesus type story as we begin to see Jesus in the words of scriptures. Jesus is throughout the scriptures. He doesn't just enter the scene in the New Testament when he's born in bodily form in the incarnation as a baby. 
Jesus is throughout the scriptures. Jesus has no beginning and no end. He is the word. The word always was, always is, and always will be. Jesus is introduced in this story. We don't see the word Jesus, but he is here. Yahweh introduces himself to Moses. Yahweh is a powerful name. Uh, Jewish rabbis and scholars actually believe that the, the name Yahweh without the vowels is our breath. Jewish rabbis and scholars would say that as we say the name Yahweh, it's the same as us taking a breath. They believe that when we're first born and we come out of our mother's womb, and our lungs are, I don't know if you knew this, but our lungs that are actually filled with liquid while we're in the womb of our mothers, when we come out of the womb and we take our first breath, all of that liquid dissipates. And for the first time, our lungs are actually filled with air and we take our first breath. And at our first breath, we say the name. <sighs> Let everything that has breath <sighs> Praise the Lord. Throughout your life, you'll say the name Yahweh 200 million times. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Yes, because our breath is the breath of Almighty God. You'll remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When the Lord formed a man, Adam, mankind, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the man became a living being. It's this moment when God breathed upon mankind that he filled mankind with his breath. And so the life we have is the breath of God sustaining us. When Jesus called the disciples and sent them by the power of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20, this is not in your notes, in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus called the disciples together as he was sending them out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what did Jesus do? It says, Jesus breathed on them. That's why in the Bible, the, the name Ruach in the Hebrew is breath, spirit. The New Testament, pneuma, is spirit, breath. We worship God with our breath. Take a deep breath. <sighs> You ever have somebody tell, just take a deep breath, calm down, take a deep breath. Husbands, you ever try to coach your wife during labor to breathe? <laughs> have you ever tried that? Any husbands go through the, yeah, I tried that with Sonia. I thought she was going to punch me in the face. <laughs> Come on, honey. <laughs> As her body is being torn apart. Just breathe, honey. But in, in, different, in different circles, and I, I just want to say this very carefully, but I don't know how somehow Eastern meditation has the corner on breathing, but do you know that you can concentrate on your breathing? It's called box breathing. You can do box breathing and think about Jesus and worship Jesus and praise him with your breath. Your breath is his. Amen.
Amen, Joel. Amen. As you take a deep breath in prayer, I've, I've just realized of just, Lord, have mercy on me for I am a sinner. I just breathe and I become more aware of his presence. I thank you, Lord, for the breath in my lungs. Thank you for the life in my body. Sometimes just the name of Jesus, as I'm calm and breathing, I'm just saying, Jesus. I just become more aware of his presence. I'll close with this verse from Acts 17, and if the worship team can get ready, we're also gonna celebrate communion. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. Paul, uh, Paul is actually quoting a, a statue that they have, a statue to the unknown God, which says on it, in him we live and move and have our being. He's actually baptizing a saying of theirs that's pagan and he's applying it to a relationship and understanding of Christ. But it's true. In him, we live and move and have our being and in our breath is his name and nature. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like silver or gold or stone an image made by human design and skill. In other words, God has not chosen to simply fill a building, an object, an icon, a cross around our neck, but he lives in you. You are a dwelling place for his presence. God is not nameless, faceless, or speechless, but rather he says to each one of us this morning, I see, I hear, and I am concerned. I am who I am, and I am with you. I'm with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are with us in all our ups and downs and meanderings, in all our detours, in sickness and in health. <laughs> when we're up or when we're down, when we're joyful or when we're anxious, God, you are with us. And I pray even now you begin to minister to each person here revealing to them each personally who you are, what you are like, and that you are with them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.